Did the prophet Adam really mess it up for the rest of us? Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum my friends. Welcome back to another episode on Mirage Muhyiddin and today we are continuing in our journey of figuring out the purpose of life with Dr. Jeffrey Lang. Just to recap again, our daily recap of what we've covered so far. Remember, we've talked about the fact that God is creating man in a positive role. This is from the Quran. God is completely aware of his plan. And in fact, he is reminding the angels that yes, you might think that uh, man can do all these horrible things, spread corruption and sow blood, but there's actually an Adamic potential. Don't just think about all the bad things man can do. Think about the highest potential of him also. And given that, he orders the angels to bow down to Adam, this incredibly symbolic gesture that man created for his potential is the highest of God's creation. So let's keep moving forward here. We were talking about this idea of who we are, and so far we've established that we have intellect, right? God taught us Adam the names. The Quran begins with read, so this idea of linguistics and intellect. Secondly, we have established that we have a sense of morality, right? You, the angels represent all the good forces in the world. Satan represents all the evil forces in the world, and man has the capacity to decipher between good and evil. Now, this might seem uh, obvious to you. You, but the reality is not is not everyone has morality okay what do i mean by that so i just thought i'd throw up this chart real quick just to kind of drive this home it's a very simple point but if you look at things that have intellect that have intellect or don't have intellect when compared to uh beings that have uh, uh no agency moral agency and those who have moral agency we can kind of just make a list just to drive the point home so Let's think of an example of something, of, uh, a creation of gods, right, that has no intellect and no moral agency. What would you say? Well, I think that's pretty easy. I could say, uh, you know, this mug right here, right? This mug, it has no intellect, nor does it have any moral agency, okay? A rock, you know, it's a piece of God's creation, neither. So let's just write that in here. Let's just fill this in right here. So we'll say... A rock, okay? It's God's creation. It doesn't have intelligence at all, you know, that we know of, and it doesn't have any moral agency. It can't choose. It doesn't know between good and bad. Okay. Can you think of something that has intelligence but doesn't have the capacity to choose between good and bad? It has no moral agency. Well, you could say a dog. A dog has intelligence, right? They know what to do. They know uh, what not to do. But can it choose between good and bad? Right? Even if you tell a dog to sit, right, it'll sit, but it might be choosing to please the owner as opposed to good and bad. So let's be very clear about this. But I'll give you a better example than even a dog. I'm going to write here, I'm going to hypothesize a young child. Okay? A young child knows the different, knows, it grows, it's learning, right? But children don't quite understand the sophistication of good and bad. For example, a child who doesn't want to share. Right? It's good to share, but a child doesn't understand that. A three-year-old or a two-year-old might not fully understand the benefit, the goodness in sharing versus the evil in hoarding. Right? So a child is an example of someone who has some in intellect but does not yet have moral agency. Which is why in Islam, you know, children are not, you know, cause called to account for their decisions because they not are not the age where they actually are responsible for the choices that they make. Okay, can you think of something that has no intellect? but yet can choose between good and bad? It's a trick question, right? Because in order to choose, you have to know. You can't choose, you can't understand what the word good and what the word bad is without having intellect. So right here, there actually is nothing. That's exclusive, right? You can't have agency if you don't have intellect. One is required for the other. And then finally, name something that has intellect and moral agency. Well, that's easy, that is us right here, right? Human beings. We can think and we know what is good and bad. And this is where we are. And so what you're learning from this is that these are two separate, unique characteristics of human beings, okay? And intellect is required first and foremost, and then secondarily, you can have moral agency, but you can't have it the other way around. And so when we see in the story of Adam, God teaches us the names, and then we see the introduction of the idea of good and evil with the angels 
and with Satan. So just wanted to kind of drive that home so it's clear for all of you. Take a look at that. If you have any questions about that, just let me know in the comments and we can discuss it uh, some more. Okay, so we've established that. And we've established in the story of Adam that the angels are being told, down, told to bow down and they all bow down except for who? Iblis, Satan. Satan does not bow down and God, you know, he makes it very clear in this and other surahs that the arrogance of Satan is the cardinal sin. And this is just, this is a whole topic that we're hopefully, God willing, get into after we finish this Purpose of Life series because there are a lot of very important other takeaways from the story, which I don't want to, you know, divert your focus from while we're talking about the purpose of life, but we are going to be talking about the fact that arrogance is the root of all evil, right? And arrogance can be manifested in terms of racism, in terms of sexism, in terms of tribalism, classism. Oh, I'm better than you because of an inherent quality within me. I mean, that's like the definition of racism, right? And you're seeing here that the root sin of all sins is this level of arrogance that Satan had for men because he later in another surah says, I'm made of fire and you made him of clay. Fire is better than clay, right? White is better than black. So this kind of thinking is the, at the root of all evil is what we're learning in the Quran. But anyway, we're not talking about that today. So going on, I'm looking at my notes right here because there's, there's a lot to process right here. So God is making it very clear the hierarchy of who is who. You have God, you have angels, and you have human beings. And God is being very clear here. If Adam, if mankind lives up to the Adamic potential, the angels will bow down to him. Okay, let's move on to the next verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. And we said in the next verse, O Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near uh, this tree. For then you will be among the wrongdoers. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةَ وَكُلَا وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ I looked at this first and I was you know, starting to wonder if the author was drifting back to the old story again. I was confused. And we said, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in a garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I thought it was drifting back to the old story. Man sins, man's punished for his sins with earthly life. Maybe the author is drifting, he had a good idea, and now he's drifting back to the sort of traditional story. Maybe he couldn't man make his mind up what story he wanted. So Dr. Lang is saying that the author is drifting back to the original story. And he's mentioned this before, okay? He's mentioned the fact that what is the original story? And when he's saying original, he's talking about the biblical story here. So I thought it would be helpful just to review the biblical story for those of you who are not familiar with the Hebrew Bible, for those of you who are not Jewish or Christian, or for those of you who might be Jewish or Christian, but you can't remember the exact details. Um, Let's put, hey, can we, uh, can we get the Bible story up here real quick? Okay, great. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just pretending like there's a whole team here. But anyway, the Bible story. Let's talk about it real fast. I'm going to fly through it very quickly for you. Just important to understand a basis for what we're talking about here. This is what the Bible story kind of roughly says. And this is just me kind of picking out the salient features. God made the world. This is in Genesis. God made the world. Then he rested on the seventh day. God made Adam from dust. Then he breathed into him. God warned Adam about that tree, that it would be the cause of his death. Then... Adam names all the creatures. So God brings the creatures up and Adam names them. Okay, it doesn't say that God taught Adam, if I remember correctly, but Adam names them. So that's another similarity. Now, God created Eve so that Adam wouldn't be lonely. Then what do we see? The serpents test, tempt Eve. So the devil tempts Eve first. Okay, telling her that this is a tree of divinity, a tree of immortality. And then Eve convinces Adam. Okay, very important here because this is, these are differences from the Quranic perspective. So Eve is the first one. She's kind of like the reason why Adam fell is because Eve is the one who uh, was convinced uh, from this. And then what we see is that both, when they make that mistake, both become aware of their nakedness, something we read in the Quran also. Then what happens is after they're made uh, aware of their nakedness, they hear God walking through the Garden of Eden. 
And God says, when he finds them, woman, what have you done? Pointing to Eve first, getting upset at Eve, right? Then what happens? God casts Adam and Eve down to earth and then hands down everlasting punishment to both of them and to their progeny, which includes us. And this is that concept of original sin, right? The sin that was committed was Eve being tempted by uh, Satan and then telling Adam. And now we are still living and carrying the burden of the mistake of our forefather Adam and our foremother Eve, right? This is the biblical tradition. And then it ends by saying, God places an angel by the tree with a fiery sword to prevent any more trespassing, right? He just puts a security system around the tree so that no one else can trespass because he didn't want it the first time. But now that there's been trespassing, let's put up a sign and now nobody will go near it. Okay, this is like a very brief overview of the biblical story. And if you look at Genesis, and I just pulled the last part of it out, the last part, Genesis 15 through 19, and I'm just, just read it with me here. God says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking to Adam, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, and this is now to all women, not just to Eve, but now you, know, you got to think about all women. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and, and conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children and thy, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Wow, these are like very heavy initial you know structures through which to uh, view the world this is the biblical verses that man will rule over woman as a punishment to woman for what she did by tempting adam goes on and then he turns to adam that was just for eve now to adam and he said because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife because you listened to your wife and you let her tempt you and you have eaten of the tree of which i've commanded you saying you shall not eat of it Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. It's a punishment to go down to earth. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the, her the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. So... The biblical account here very important that you know this and you understand this because this is setting up a lot of understandings it's setting up that god is upset he's furious at adam and eve he's so upset not only is he damning eve and adam to a lifelong uh, toil he's damning us we weren't even there when it happened but we are damned because of this on top of that we're seeing there is a difference in how God is punishing Eve and how God is punishing Adam. He is not treating them the same. He's looking at Eve as the one who started this whole business, right? So these are really important things to understand because this influences Western thought. This influences Judeo-Christian thought because this is the first story. And it is my belief that this story, even though it is not our story as Muslims, has affected and in, uh, I don't want to use the word infected because it's kind of harsh, but it is definitely seeped into our understanding also but this is not the quranic story as we are going to find out so with that being said let's let dr lang continue his exploration of the story of adam and eve with that background going into the quran and we said oh adam dwell you and your spouse in a garden and eat freely thereof what you wish but come not near this tree for you will be among the wrongdoers I thought it was drifting back to the old story. Man sins, man's punished for his sins with earthly life. Maybe the author is drifting. He had a good idea, and now he's drifting back to the sort of traditional story. Maybe he couldn't man make his mind up what story he wanted. Except for a couple things about this verse, and this happened with almost every verse as I read through it, is that uh, the whole tenor of the passage is sort of uh, not the, what you would expect. I noticed that the Quran in this story has a tremendous penchant for understating things. Because it says, uh, and said to Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish to Adam and his spouse. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I mean, there's no sense of God being threatened by the possibility of man eating from the tree. In this story, we don't see that, you know, in this verse, we don't see that God is nervous at the prospect, that he's threatened by the prospect, that he's anxious about it. The tree that he picks, he picks it seems like he's just picking out any tree. Nothing special about the tree. Go not near uh, this tree. 
for you will be among the wrongdoers. Satan will later come to him and tell him it's a tree of eternal life, of a kingdom that never decays. Turns out to be a complete faucet in his part. Nothing special about the tree. It's just a tree. God's not nervous at the prospect at all. You know, in the tradition that I came from, God is threatened by the prospect. He has to put an angel with a fiery sword, a sword by to protect the tree so that mankind never goes next to it again. I'm not putting it down. I'm just pointing out the difference of the story. They're both beautifully told. But he you know, has to guard the tree. Why? Because if they eat from it, they'll become gods like us. This man, he saw already he has a rebellious nature. Can you imagine if he eats from the, this tree? No, can't let him get near that tree. <clears throat> but here, just you know, calmly says, you know, but if you do, you'll be among the wrongdoers. God is not worried about himself. It's just a warning man, making it clear that if you do this, you've committed a wrongful deed. <clears throat> Again, the, the whole tenor of the past, all these verses that you read through it is God knows exactly what he's doing. Okay, next verse. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go you all down, some of you being the enemies of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. What, I said? <laughs> I mean... You know, I was expecting now the rage, the anger, the violence, the jealousy. That's what I was expecting. Okay, they eat from the tree. Where's the rage, the violence? I'm going to punish you now. You're going to sweat on earth. And you're going to suffer. And you're going to stub your toe. And you're going to work. And you're going to labor. And you're going to die there for what you did. And where is the woman? All right. <laughs> And the woman, right? She's the one who's going to suffer the most, right? She'll have to suffer labor pains and monthly cycles, right? And bleeding and crying out when her children come into the world. And she'll scream out. And worst of all, the greatest humiliation, the man will rule over her. When he's obviously her intellectual inferior because she and the angels seduced, she and, she, she and Satan seduced him and he just bumbled along and didn't commit a real, you know, wrong deed. <laughs> well, I don't mean to make light of it. But the story is obviously different, though. You know, no, no threat here. As a matter of fact, look at the way it says, O Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be the among the wrongdoers. Then they make the mistake. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go all you down. Some of you being enemies of others will be adversaries of others. Some of you will be adversaries of each other. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. This is not a deity losing it. If you look at it, I mean, on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. That's not the words of a, of a God that has got lost you know, that is really extremely upset. On earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. When I walked into the hotel today, and they said, uh, and it's this nice one up here, I don't know the name, of it. I can't remember the name of it, but that's a continental breakfast. <laughs> and they said, uh, your room will be room uh, 111, and uh, there's a continent, continental breakfast in the morning. I didn't say, <gasps> you know, I didn't think they were mad at me. Because you know, he said, you know, you're going to sleep here and this is going to be your provision in the morning. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but notice something else about this verse. I mean, when you read these verses for the first time, I don't know, maybe I'm nuts. And many people think I am. But when you read these verses for the first time, I mean, this is just so much that catches your attention. But Satan caused them to slip. I remember, I, I couldn't get that verse out of, that, those words out of my head. Satan caused them to slip. To slip? The greatest sin in the history of the human race, and it's called a slip? You know, in my culture, slip means, you know, you just momentarily, for a fraction of a second, you lose your focus. It's not a big deal. My Uncle Bob used to always say to me, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late, I slipped up. You know, it's, the understanding is it's no big deal, it's just a slip. You know, that's what we say when we make a minor mistake. I slipped up. Don't worry about it. Never happen again. A slip, I said. 
momentary loss of focus? The greatest sin in the history of humanity? Why we're all here? Why we're all suffering? Why we experience death? A slip? I didn't believe it. I went to my Arabian friends at that time. I didn't know any Arabic. They came to this verse. We went through it line by line. I said, now don't change any words. Just read them one at a time. But Satan made them. And I said, okay, this one. This one right here. What does it mean? Tell me what that means. They looked at it. It says, uh, slip. (laughs) Slip. And expelled them from the state in which they were. A slip, I thought? But then maybe I was trying to force the traditional understanding, the traditional interpretation. Maybe it was just a slip. I mean, after all, they didn't commit murder. They didn't commit robbery, rape, pillaging, assault. They they, they, ate a couple of pieces of fruit. It's not the greatest sin in the history of humanity by any means. And then the next verse says, and then they were expelled from the state in which they were. Well, what state were they? Let's see now. Let's go back from where we started. First, mankind is being taught. We see he's an intellectual being. Then we show he's a moral being. Moral being means he's a being that's going to have to make choices. And then God gives him this choice. It's not a huge deal. It's not the gravest sin in the history of humanity by any means. It's minor by any standards. They make it, though. We see that God originally intended to put man on earth as his vicegerent. We see a period of preparation where he's being prepared intellectually, where he's growing intellectually, where he's growing as a moral creature. When does God finally put him on earth? What signals that he's ready to begin? He makes his first independent choice. It's not the worst deed in the history of humanity. It's minor on anybody's scale, but it shows that mankind is ready to act on his own to be his own, to make his own choices, that God has empowered him to make choices, and he's ready to make them and carry them out and see them most often to their expected ends, if God wills. Wow, so we have covered a lot right now. That was a very deep dive that he just did, talking about the fact that Adam's action was just a slip, as according to the Quranic narrative, okay? And it is not so much that Adam chose the the fruit to eat from the tree, it was that Adam made the choice. He exercised choice for the first time, which is really where Dr. Lang is putting the emphasis here. So let's do a quick recap of what we have covered in today's episode, okay? First of all, we definitely know, okay? I mean, I've said said this every single episode, but I want it to be just burned into your head, so there's no question about it, that God knows what he's doing. He is in complete control of the situation, and he is placing man, Adam, on earth in a very positive role for the potential to become the highest version of himself, okay? In terms of what are man's unique characteristics. What is so great about us? What's so special about us? We have established that one, we have intellect. We know the names of things that the angels don't know. Two, we have a sense of morality of good and evil. And we can, what? Three, choose. We have the capacity to choose. Okay. Man is given an opportunity to choose. Let me try to get out of the way here for this one so you can read it. This, see, this stuff might seem obvious to you. In fact, sometimes these things are so obvious that you can't see it. But not everything has the capacity to choose, right? We can exercise choice. Angels don't have choice. And it's so hard for us to imagine that because choice is such a part of our everyday life that it's sometimes hard to imagine what is life without choice. That is life. No, that is human life. Right, But there are other types of existence out there. But we're being taught in the Quran that we take this thing for granted all the time. But this is what makes us special. We can choose to obey God. We can choose to disobey God. And this is clear from the Quranic story. Now, one thing that I want to do is I want to go and just start comparing the biblical narrative to the Quranic narrative. Right? Remember in that previous slide, we brought, I kind of gave you a summary of all what the Bible is saying in Genesis about the, the, the creation story, the story of Adam. Right? What are some of the major takeaways from the Bible story? Let's just take a look at a couple of them real quick. God had to rest after the seventh day. God was surprised, right? This was not the plan. Adam, what are you doing? I told you not to do this. Why did you do it, right? It's like a father who has like a disobedient kid. God then blames Eve first and foremost for the 
quote, fall of Adam. Then God punishes both of them. God then punishes us. And then God sets up an angel to protect the tree so that no one else goes near it. What are you getting from this? What is the overlying sentiment of this message, right? I would say that God is furious, right? This is kind of like the defining, like if you could like say what it is right here, it's this fury. God is furious at Adam. Damn it. Why did you do this when I told you not to do it? And we are suffering from that fury. Okay. And when you start from this relationship where you're like, you know, you know, I, we're using this example of a father-son relationship because it's easy for us to, you know, to understand relationships in those terms. If the first thing that the son learns from his father is that when he's brought into this world, his father was furious with him. Imagine you're the fourth born and the dad, the first, your oldest brother really did something stupid. And now when you're born into the world, your dad is even mad at you. You, you're just like the rest of them, your eldest one and blah, 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 blah. How does that set you up for having a loving relationship with God? And this is something that, you know, I can't imagine coming, you know, and again, to be totally fair, the biblical tradition, it's a beautiful tradition and we should honor all different religious traditions. I'm not in any way trying to put down different, you know, faiths and put down their narratives or the creation story and so forth. But I am trying to show you the stark differences between the two because this is fury, right? We say fire and brimstone. There's fury. God is angry. He's ticked off, right? The Quranic narrative is different. What have we learned so far? A, if we said God had to rest on the seventh day, as Muslims, we do not believe that God needs rest. This is like most, one of the salient understandings of God. We say this almost every day in the famous verse, Ayat al-Kursi, God is not in need of sleep nor slumber. He doesn't need rest. He is in control. He is above all that. There's no rest for God. God knows exactly what he's doing. He's not surprised by what's unfolding in front of him. He created everything. Time and space, cause and effect, that's all under God's control. So he's not surprised at all. He's, um, he's omnipotent and he's omniscient, okay? And then this thing that sets off God's wrath and anger in the Bible, in the Quran, what does God call this thing right here? He calls it a slip, and Adam slipped. Very interesting, very important here, because you're seeing there is a huge difference between the tone of this story and this story, and it sets up our relationship with our Creator, right? Because what is God's tone? We're going to find out in the next episode. How does God feel about Adam and Eve? Because we're seeing right here, He is really not happy over here. He's not happy with them, and He's not happy with us. Let's see, how does God view humankind based on the narrative from the Quran? Very important question here. So anyway, that's a lot for today. I let you listen to a lot. I let you listen to it. You can listen to this all you want. You know, I've listened to Dr. Lang's uh, series at least 20 times just to really understand it. And that's the reason why I'm going slowly through this is because I want this to be so crystal clear for you. I don't want you to ever feel like, oh, wait, I can't remember. What was he getting at in that first part? And second. It's all laid out here. And I'll just let you know also, um, in, one of the in some of the final videos, probably the final video, I am going to do a complete breakdown of it just like in one shot, like a very fast summary. He said this, 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 and this is why it all makes sense. And this is what he's suggesting as a purpose of life. So don't stress out if you feel like you have to keep up and whatever. I will break it down for you and do a summary video of this entire series for you guys so it is crystal clear for you. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Feel free to share this with anyone who you think might benefit from it. You know, one thing I don't uh, ask you guys maybe often enough is that I would love for you to guys to subscribe to my channel. It helps me keep track of who's watching, how this channel is growing, and it just kind of, as a creator, it helps to kind of just um, uh, expand my message, right? To kind of just scale out my message and so forth. The more subscribers I have, the more uh, it gets easier for me to kind of achieve what I'm trying to achieve, which is just help people find purpose in their lives. So anyway, can't wait to see you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much for being a part of this with me. It really means, means a lot to me. I will see you guys soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.